Hello and welcome. Uh, in this video, uh, we're picking up where we left off with the first translation lecture. Uh, in the first translation lecture, we talked about the three different translation types and their relative advantages and disadvantages in a fairly abstract way. Uh, in, so that focused more on differences. Now I want to pay attention, one, to the actual practical process of doing the translation, and instead of focusing on differences, focusing on commonalities, things that will always be the same no matter which translation technique you apply. And remember that translation is the process of turning an entity relationship diagram, which is a designed for a database at a high conceptual level, you know, that's human readable, into a relational schema that we can actually put into practical application in the relational database management system. Okay, so basically what we're doing in translation before we get into the commonalities is translation equals which ERD components get tables. That is really the essential question here. And also, secondarily, how are those tables joined? Okay. Okay. So, we've got some common rules in terms of which components get tables. Every, and these are across all three translation techniques, every entity, whoops, sorry. Let me start that over. Every entity gets its own table. That's always. Okay. What's at issue across the three techniques is what about what about relationships? These differ. How do they differ? Based on cardinality, so based on the constraints, based on cardinality, and in some cases based on participation. They will differ. And they will differ from one set of cardinality and participation to the next, and they will differ between our translation techniques. But some things are always, always the case, and here's one. Always, if you have a, let's say, x, and the relationship can be has, even though that's not a very good relationship name in general, this is an abstract example, x has y. And if the cardinality relationship here, if a given instance of x can have multiple instances of y, and a given instance of y can have multiple instances of x, then we have a many-to-many -many relationship. Many-to-many -many relationships always get their own table. So always it'll be the case that there will be a table for x, there will be a table for has, and there will be a table for y. Always many to many, this relationship will get its own table. So I think it's a good idea when you're in the process of translating an ER diagram into a set of relational schema for you to draw a circle around what's going to become a table. So we have three circles here. You know, relationship's going to get its own table. We'll have three tables. Here's our convention for a relational schema. First, we put the title of the table, and the title will match the name of each of the components in the diagram. So we'll have an X table. Let's assume, for sake of argument, X has a X identifier as its primary key. And then X also has w whatever, phone number, address, etc. Okay, so this is our convention for creating a translation or a relational schema. The title of the table the primary key specified by an underline, and then all of the actual attributes that we're interested in storing for that entity. Okay, so there's the X table. Here's the Y table. Y number, start date. You know, I'm just making up the attributes here, of course, and whatever other attributes. Okay, so we got the Y table. We've got primary key is the Y number and the start date. Then we have the interesting case of the has table. Okay, so the primary key of a relationship, okay, is going to equal 
one, the other, or both of the primary keys of the participating relationships, depending on cardinality. Okay, so here's the question to ask yourself with regard to has. Okay, so for a given instance of, of uh, the has relationship, can it be the case that we could uniquely identify this relationship with only the Y number attribute? Can we do, can we do Y number? Y number alone? We can't, and here's why. Because if we just use Y number, we will still have multiple instances of X number. So we could have, uh, if Y number is three, so we have, let's say Y number and X number here. If Y number is three, X number could be one. If Y number is three, X number is two. If we try to use just Y number, as the primary key, we know right here we have a violation of that. Primary keys need to be unique. And th three, if three shows up twice, there's nothing unique about that. Same with X. We can't do X number, X number, al X number alone. No, neither of these things. And here's why. Uh, we could also we have three and one and three and two. We could also have four and one and six and two. So we say if we use just X number, here's one instance of just one, here's one instance of just one. Is there anything unique about one if it shows up repeatedly? No, this is a violation of the possibility of the primary key. So too are these two instances of two. So we cannot use just Y for the primary key and we cannot use just X for the primary key. If we use the two of them together, however, three and one, that's unique from three and two from four and one, and from six and two. So what we're saying here is because this is a many-to-many -many relationship, we need both sides' primary keys to assure uniqueness within the relationship table, and X number and Y number put together will be the primary key. Because if we looked at just Y, no uniqueness there. If we looked at just X, no uniqueness there. But if we bring them together, then we achieve our uniqueness and any other relationship or any other relationship attributes which are relatively rare would be included in the has attribute so if you're following along with the discussion of the primary keys that's great if you're not don't panic because we will take it up in further detail as we go into each of the three translation techniques what i really want you to be aware of right now is that when we have a many-to-many -many relationship, no matter what translation technique we're using, we always have three resultant tables. A table for the left-hand side entity, a table for the right-hand side entity, and a table for the relationship. The table for the relationship has as its primary keys the combination of the primary keys of the two participating entities. Okay, So it's really just a question of wrote rules if you'd like, although ultimately it will be enormously helpful for you to be able to think through primary keys and what achieves uniqueness and what does not. But if you're not there yet, don't panic. We'll hit it on the next video where we talk about the mapped translation process. All right. In the meantime, study hard and uh, I'll see you online.